Well, my name is Pastor Micah. We're going to be continuing our series today on family values. Come on, we're a note-taking church. If it's your first time, first time in a long time, uh, we would encourage you to take notes. We've got people, hosts going around and handing those out for you. It's easier to remember things when you write them down. Amen. Well, hey, uh, we're going to be talking this morning on the subject of gratitude. Aren't you excited you came to church? gratefulness, gratitude, uh, really the motto there, this isn't just our family value, this is a value in scripture we're going to see as we read together today um, that we get to do this. Come on, say, I get to, I get to do this gratefulness, we get to do this, but you know, the problem with gratitude, the challenge with it is, how can I be grateful when so much of life doesn't seem very great? How can I be grateful when so much of life doesn't seem very great? This morning I got a text. I was in here early at 7 a.m. being very spiritual, praying before the Lord, and I was saying, Lord, would you help me grow in my gratitude? Can I tell you that you need to be careful what you pray for? The Lord will grow us by testing us. And um, I get a text from my beautiful wife, uh, and she goes, hey, babe, I don't know, this is 8 o'clock, 8.30, the morning's moving, and she goes, hey, our dog Rosie uh, decided to do some diarrhea all over the couch and carpet, and somehow on the wall, apparently she's got superpowers, she can get that onto the wall, and um, hey, I'm grateful for an amazing wife who I told, by the way, just so you know this story for me, I said, do not clean that up. I'll take care of it when I get home. But she cleaned it up anyway because she's amazing. Come on. Um, Say grateful. Grateful. It was hard for me to have a good attitude this morning. I wasn't looking forward to church ending for several reasons. Grateful we get to do this. You know, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Colossia, in, in the book of Colossians, he's writing what's known as a prison epistle. He was in prison. He was in shackles. He was being starved to death. He was being beaten and mistreated. And it's in this context of, in this environment, that Paul writes to the church and actually is encouraging them on how to live the Christian life well. Maybe you're in the room this morning or watching online and you're like, well, I don't know if I'm a Christian yet. I don't know if I believe in all this Jesus stuff. Well, that's okay. We're glad that you're here this morning. We're going to get a clear glimpse into what it looks like to be a part of the family of God. Y'all with me say family values. Beginning in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. I always feel like the Holy Spirit leaves when he stops playing the piano. The piano is called a Nord. I always say we need the Nord for the Lord. Come on, somebody. That's a corny joke. Y'all ready? Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul says, here's a great reminder. God loves you and has chosen you as his special people. So be, uh uh-oh, here's the hard part. We're all like, oh, I love being loved. Who doesn't love being loved? And then he goes, okay, but out of this love, be gentle, kind, humble, meek, patient. Put up with each, some of y'all stop reading. Put up with each other and forgive anyone who does you wrong. Say anyone. Just as Christ has forgiven you, love is more important than anything else. It is, think about, he's in prison. Like he's being persecuted, he says, forgive anyone that's done you wrong. Love is more important than anything. It is what ties everything completely together. Each one of you is part of the body of Christ. And you were chosen to live together in peace. So let, say let, the peace that comes from Christ control your thoughts. And here it is, and be grateful. Let, say let. The message about Christ completely fill your lives while you use all wisdom to teach and instruct other people with 
thankful hearts. Here it is. Sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to God. Whatever you say or do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give complaints. What does it say? As you give thanks to God the Father because of him. I want to look this morning at three disciplines of gratitude. The word discipline, really, that root word is just, it just means to learn. Did you know that? It's what we can learn. Did you know you can learn to be grateful? You know you can, we can teach our hearts to be grateful. So the first discipline, the first opportunity to learn is we can be grateful, here it is, in our relationships. We can be grateful in our relationships. The word says God loves you, he has chosen you, so now be gentle and kind and forgiving and peaceful towards other people the same way God has forgiven and loved you. Here's the insight in your notes, and I know for some of us we've heard this over and over, but let it be fresh this morning. Never get tired of hearing it. Never feel like you've graduated from it. Here's the truth in your notes. God loves you. And he starts with this thought, hey, don't forget that the creator of the cosmos, the one who holds all things together, the one who has all authority in heaven on earth, he has chosen you, he loves you, and has forgiven you. Is anyone thankful, grateful this morning that even though you didn't qualify for it, even though you weren't worthy of it, even though we didn't deserve it, that God loves you and he forgives you this morning? Here's why that's important in your notes. When we choose to accept and we have to let, we have to accept it, that the, the love and forgiveness that God offers us, and we find the ability within ourselves to offer love and forgiveness to others as well, say relationships. So what in the world does this have to do with gratefulness, Micah? You're talking about God's love. What does that have to do? The word grateful in the Hebrew is this word shana, which means, you ready? To have compassion on, on someone to bestow favor, and then I love this. We have this in my, in my house right above our steps. It says to see the good. Gratefulness is choosing to see the good. How can I be so grateful when so much of life doesn't seem great? It's to have compassion. Have you ever considered that being gentle, kind, humble, meek, patient, forgiving are connected to being grateful? I heard a story uh, just this past week, but it happened a few weeks ago. There was a young guy that uh, showed up to a church and burnt all of their, uh, set their vans on fire, their buses, did a bunch of damage. And um, how, how many of y'all would just be praising Jesus? Just such good news. Can't wait to hear that all of our stuff got destroyed. No, well, it's, it's kind of devastating. The pastor had every right to be upset, but you know what he chose to do? He, he chose to extend gratitude and compassion. He actually ended up going to where this young man was incarcerated and uh, had a conversation with him and told him about the God who, while we were still sinners, chose to forgive us anyway. The God that says that no one is righteous, no, not one, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The God that says no matter what you've done, Romans chapter eight, nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. And he started to extend grace and compassion, and guess what? This young man gave his heart to Jesus. What was happening right there? You had a Christian acting like a Christian, extending gratitude, it's, it's say relationships. And because of that, this young man found a relationship with the Lord. When we choose to be grateful for what God is able, has done for us, we're able to extend grace. Does anyone need some grace this morning to others? So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Why do I need to do this? This seems too hard. The big deal is this in your notes. When we refuse to be grateful, um, it, it's one of the surest ways to stay miserable. You want to stay miserable? Be ungrateful. Anybody love to hang out with some ungrateful? Anybody looking to go to work and show me where the ungrateful people are? I want to eat lunch with them. You know, my dad used to say that misery loves company. I don't want to be around someone that's miserable all the time. But here's the challenge, and I want to be honest in the room. This sounds really good. But many of us have good reasons not to be grateful. 
I would just suggest this morning they're not good enough. You have good reasons. Life is hard. We've all lived a little bit. Gratitude is not a weapon that we can use to bypass hard feelings and move past difficult things and act and spiritually gaslight ourselves. No, I should just be grateful. But gratitude actually allows me not to just move it, but to use the spirit of God as a light and a way out of the darkness. Gratitude is a guide out of the difficult things into the freedom that God wants for me. How can we be grateful in the middle of grief? Many, many of us, grief has been the loudest part of our story recently. And that's, and that's real. God doesn't want to diminish that. He's just saying you don't have to stay there. So it's been said that grief is, is love without anywhere to go. Grief is love without a home. And I wanna suggest this morning that if that's true, gratitude is the home where love and where relationships can grow. If grief is love without a home, I was thinking about a young mother several years ago lost her son to a drunk driving accident. Tragic. She has good reason to be embittered and resentful and angry and, uh, uh, and callous. Good reasons, but never good enough. What she noticed was, even though the guy who caused the accident was in prison, her resentment was actually causing her to live in prison. Prison of unforgiveness, the prison of anger, the prison of bitterness. See, the gospel is inviting us to let go. Come on, it's cliche. We see it on bumper stickers, to let go and what? And let, and let God, gratitude. When I let God be God and I trust him, and you know what she did? She decided to go and forgive this man because she was a Christian. She understood uh, what God had done for her. She actually extended grace to him. It didn't undo the pain. It didn't undo the bad things that happened. But we know what it did do. It brought freedom to him and freedom to her. And he received the Lord that day as a result, say, relationships. See, becoming more grateful does not involve a denial of the, of the hard reality of life and its sharp edges and its uh, sharp sorrows, but gratitude both recognizes the dark corners, but it also recognizes the beauty and the joy and the goodness of God. I would put it this way, gratefulness isn't just experienced, although you ever got a gift and you're so grateful or you get to go on vacation, you're grateful. It's not just an experience, but it's, a, it's an expression. It is something we can choose to do. It's a discipline. I can learn how to do it. I want to encourage someone with this in my notes uh, that the world that is obscene, seems to be obsessed with pointing out what's wrong, in that kind of world, gratitude becomes a superpower. You want to have superpower at work? You want to have superpower on your football team? You want to have superpower in your friend group? Be grateful. Try gratefulness. Try to see the good. What does gratitude do in your notes? Gratitude gives us the power, say power, to fight back against the tyranny of what isn't with what is. It helps me to see the good. It helps me to see what can be. I want to be around some people who don't just take the temperature, but I want to be around some people who know how to set it. Some people who can say, I know this is where it is, but it's not where we're going to stay. I can see the good, and I have some faith. This morning I was thinking about a few weeks ago on the 3rd of July, right before the 4th, in case you don't know how numbers work. Y'all awake? The 3rd of July. Never forget it, 2024, the 3rd of July, because it was around 11 o'clock at night, Amante, and I was tired. Do you get tired? I'm a dad with two little kids. I was tired. I wanted to go to bed, and all of a sudden, my son, Eli, who's in the room, I'm sorry, buddy, his tummy hurt. And you know what I said? Go to bed, because I'm a good dad. <laughs> I said, you're fine. You don't have a stomach ache. You need to sleep. And I was more worried about my own sleep than my son. And I was having a bad attitude. And my wife said, no, no, I think he has a problem. I'm like, sure. So let's get in the truck. I'm having a bad attitude. I'm like, they're just going to take his temperature and we're going to come home. And now I'm going to go to bed at 1 instead of 11. So we're on our way there. And I'm having a bad attitude. And we get in there. And then they need him. I don't know why they do this. Maybe there's a nurse in the room and I'm just uneducated. They needed him to drink. It looked like five gallons of dark liquid. 
to be able to take a scan. And I'm like, what is happening? That, my son can't drink that. He had, I came here because his stomach hurts. So we're there literally for eight hours, but in the middle of the night, like I was, I was not, I was trying to hold together for my son, but I was inside. I'm like, man, what is happening? And I don't know if you remember this, Eli, you were kind of drugged up, but <laughs> amen. <laughs> um, man, I just said, Eli, let's, you know what? We have a lot to be thankful for. And the Lord began to shift my spirit. And com- you ever feel conviction before? Like, oh, man, I messed up, and I blew this whole thing, and, um, and the Lord began to, and you know what happened? I started to say, son, you know what? We have a hospital to be in right now. We have doctors that are trained. We have this five gallons of juice that we get to drink. <laughs> say, I get to. We have machines that can see what's happening inside. And you know what started to happen? The room began to shift. Until that point, I was not a blessing to my wife or my son I needed an attitude adjustment. Come on, say gratitude. You know, gratefulness is one of the best ways we can be a gift to others. You want your presence to be a gift to somebody? Be grateful. You want to be a gift to your family? Be grateful. Come on, some of us, like, like it's, it's not just that we're providing. That's important. Like, we can bring, pay the bills and do the vacations. Hey, I've been on some vacations with people that I did not want to be with. And I, I grew up with a family uh, that would take me on vacation, and they complained about everything. It was always, uh, let's look at the 1% that's wrong and ignore the 99% right. And you know what? I never enjoyed that. I always came back, man. I'm like, I can't wait to see my family because this is miserable, so we can, choose, we can choose to see the good, be a gift to others. Well, how do I do that, Pastor Micah? Well, it leads to number two. It starts with the heart. Like, like most things that matter, it's a matter of the heart. Y'all with me this morning? So discipline number two, gratefulness in our hearts. Each one of you is part of the body of Christ. You were chosen, verse 15, to live together in peace. So let, say let. The key here is, Paul's saying you have to let the peace of God fill you and, and, and strengthen you. God is a gentleman. God, God's not forcing his way into the door of your life. He's knocking. I don't know if you've ever had someone knock on your door before, but usually you have to, like, I don't know, respond and open for them to come in. The Lord is knocking. Say let. And so many of us have been in church for years, but God's never gotten into us. We haven't let him. We're holding on to, and, and for good reasons a lot of time. But the invitation this morning is to let go of the good reasons and to hold on to some God hope and God reasons and God belief that when we let God's peace control our thoughts, he can change us. We can let him fill our life and lead us. We can let go of bitterness Gratefulness is really the discipline of, of, of grabbing my heart and reminding it that God is still on the throne. You know, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Say bad news. But then he said right after that, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. What does that mean? It means grab your heart. Don't let your heart grab you. Don't let your heart control you. Take heart for I've, where's our hope? Our hope is in Jesus. I'm going to take heart. I'm going to grab my heart and choose to be grateful. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never fail. Here's the challenge in your notes. It's difficult to be grateful. Come on, somebody. I, I, someone needs to hear this in the room. I know the Lord was speaking to me as I was writing this. It's difficult to be grateful when my heart is resentful. And why, here, here's why that matters. Here's why gratitude matters, because I believe gratitude can become a guide. This is a long fill in the blank, so I'm sorry, but it, it's worth it. You ready? Follow me. Gratitude can become a guide in the midst of our greatest suffering, and some of us have some suffering that we're walking through right now but it can help us grow beside the things that are hurting us so that those things don't grow inside of us. Gratitude allows me to, I don't have to diminish 
or act like that thing didn't happen or, or, or bypass it. Gratitude just allows me to step next to it and help the Lord guide me through it instead of allowing that thing to grow inside of me. I can grow beside it with the power and the strength of the God who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. The God who says, uh, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. The God that says, I'm the good shepherd. I can lead you by still waters. I can lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. And so it allows me to walk walk hand in hand with God and not hand in hand with my misery. Some of us have married our misery. We've been meditating on offense. We've been surrendering to hopelessness. And here's the challenge. Resentment rarely produces contentment. When I marry my resentment, I'm living in discontentment. Can anyone relate? Or is that just me in the room? So it's not that the bad things didn't happen. It's that you don't have to live there. Jesus promised in this world you have trouble. He says in this world there will be offense. But the invitation of Jesus is to give us a greater perspective. Here it is. He gives us an unencumbered heart. So how does he do that, Micah? I would love to have a heart that isn't paralyzed by grief and all the things I've been walking through. And you know what? It's not, it's not super complex. It's pretty simple, but it's not simplistic. It's simple, easy to understand, difficult to do. And here's what it is. God will make a way when we allow him into the places where we are wounded. And some of us will live to 70 years old and never do that. Some of us have lived the last 17 years with that. Listen, it's painful, and you know what it takes? It takes trust. That God's not just going to crush you or expose you, but he's going to heal you and mend you. So how do I get this gift? It's I have to allow him into the places where I'm wounded. Many of us um, have been trying. It's like a pen, right? And we've been trying to get something out, and there's nothing coming out. And we can't shame our way into healing. We can't should our way into wholeness. We can't, uh, we, we can't, imagine if I'm trying to write, and I'm like, come on, come on, come out. There's nothing, oh my goodness, man, this should work. Man, after a period of time, you're like, Micah, are you crazy? There's nothing in there. It ran out of what? It ran out of ink. You don't just need to hold it. You don't just need to try harder. You don't just need to yell it. You need what? You need something new on the inside. There's something missing on the inside. And many of us have been trying to fix our life with exterior things. We thought the house would fix it. We thought the job would fix it. We thought the new husband would fix it. We thought the new car would fix it. We thought the retirement would fix it. Guess what? It's not going to fix it because it's an inside thing. The Lord wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to fill you, but I have to what? I have to let. Say let. The Spirit of God can empower us and strengthen us when we let him. You may be thinking this morning, well, that's easy for you to say. You don't know what I've been through. And you know what? I don't. But you know who does? His name's God. So here's my question. Will you let him lead you? Will you let him heal you? Here's another question. What has been leading you? Who have we been listening to? Whose voice has been the loudest? Who have I been letting guide me? Has it been my misery? Has it been my pain? Many of us have good reasons to stay there, but I'm telling you this morning, it's not good enough because on the other side of our good reasons, if we'll get past that, is a God who can help us and a God who can heal us and a God who can guide us. Say let. So many of us have to choose this as a discipline. We have to learn. I love this quote from Henry Nguyen. He says this. He says, gratitude as a discipline, read it with me, involves a conscious choice. I can choose to be grateful even when my emotions and feelings are still steeped in hurt and resentment. The choice, say the choice, for gratitude rarely comes without some real effort. Most of us don't just wake up feeling grateful even though yesterday we were hateful. We have to choose. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Have you ever noticed how pain and sorrow And disappointment can make us small, make us inward, make us sickly. Gratitude, here's here's the thing. Gratitude is not about making what we're going through small or making it like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's just making God big. 
It's just saying, yeah, like that's, that sucks and we're walking through that, but God's big. But God's on the, like God sees yesterday, today, and forever. Like God's never woken up surprised. God didn't pace back and forth last night anxious in his bedroom. He didn't go, oh, I didn't know that was gonna happen. We have a God that we can hold hands with who's the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher. And guess how the story ends? It ends with victory. It ends with God on the throne. It ends with the saints singing praises, every knee bowing, every tongue confessing that he is Lord. We know how the story ends. So I can choose to be grateful so here's the truth gratefulness here it is in our notes gratefulness helps us to lift our eyes from where we are to who God is and you know what that's called it's called worship and that leads us to point number three discipline number three for a life of gratitude is gratefulness in our worship many of us have stopped being grateful in our worship The scripture says, with thankful hearts. With what? Thankful hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs of God. Whatever you say or do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here's the insight in your notes. Gratitude is the stem cell of genuine worship. Gratitude. What is worship anyway? Well, worship comes from these two words, worth-ship. It's something that has worth or value. Some of us struggle to worship because we don't know if God's worth it. Some of us give very little to God because we think very little of God. Worship, how can I be grateful? It's hard for me to receive what God wants to give me when I'm in church or watching online or whatever, when I'm holding on, not letting go, not trusting. Worship is when I say, you know what, you're worth it. I'm going to bow down. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to exalt you. The band can come on out here. I'm just calling them out because we got three minutes. And you don't want me to go over. We all want lunch. When we choose to be grateful, when we choose to trust God, we can begin to experience this peace. I was thinking back to uh, 2017. I was in this room Uh, had just walked in over here on the, I guess it would be your left, my right, Um, and man, I did not want to be here. You ever been there? I had just moved back from a really, one of the toughest seasons um, to this point in my life with with family and all kinds of things. I didn't have a job at the time. We had two little kids. Eli was uh, maybe two years old, and um, Judah was just a few months old, and I felt like God had failed me, that God had let me down, that I had taken risk, and He didn't respond that I had trusted. And he said, well, I'm going to leave you in the dust. And I felt like, you know what? I'm not going to worship because I don't know if it's worth it. And I literally for months would sit out in the lobby out there while worship was happening. Because I felt like, you know what? I don't want to, this is fake. I don't want to do this. I don't even know if I believe this. I would just come sit back there for the message. And you know what was happening? I was dealing with some real pain. I was dealing with some real hurt, but I had to learn that God was bigger than that. The moment I decided to trust and I was walking in the hallway up there on the third floor, not trying to be overly dramatic, but I just remember what happened. I said, Lord, I'm just gonna trust you. I can't do this anymore. I'm so depressed, I'm so angry. You know what the Lord began to do when I started to let him? He started to shift me started to move you know what worship's my favorite thing now we're about to worship worship's my favorite part of the service i love to work why because he's worth it we get to do this i don't have to do this i don't have to go to church i don't, i get to participate in what god's doing i don't have to go to work i get to wake up with a body and mind that's working i don't have to do this i get to do this some of us don't worship because God hasn't been worth it. I was just thinking about, you know, why do kids give so much to travel league, soccer and baseball and this and that? And why do we do all these things? Well, many of us were willing to give our time and energy and effort to our mortgage and to our vacation. And none of that's wrong. Like God, he wants to bless your family. I'm not condemning any of that. But the reason we're willing to give so much there is because deep down we feel like, you know what, it's worth it. It's worth it to wake up at 5.30 and take my daughter to to dance rehearsal. It's worth it. And so you know that's called? It's called worship. 
And I wonder how many of us, when it comes to the things of God, we go, no, I'm too tired. No, that's for other people. I don't have time for that. Uh, wh- worship means it's worth it. And I wonder what kind of worth has g- God has in our lives when we're sitting here going, man, Lord, I'm giving you everything. There is a God and I'm not it. I'm not the sole inventor of my success. I can't justify and save myself. I can't claim the credit for everything that's happened in my life. I'm the recipient of enormous grace. He doesn't owe me anything. I owe God everything. How could I do so little for God when he's done so much for me? When I think about what the Lord has done, I have to bow down. I have to worship. I have to say, you're the king of kings. You're the Lord of Lords. It doesn't matter what car I drive. It doesn't matter what the bank account says. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. I'm not worried. I'm not more worried about the college I'm getting into and the career I'm going to have than the condition of my soul. You're the one who made me. You're the one who knows me. My destiny is in your hands. Everything is yours. You're never surprised. You're never caught off guard. You're the beginning and the end. And I'm choosing in the worship be Lord come on would you stand to your feet even when I don't feel it you're working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't know it you're working come on let's worship we thank you Lord shadow of death we will fear no evil because your rod comforts us it guides us you're standing next to us you help us Lord we thank you help us to be grateful in our relationships help us to be grateful in our hearts and help us to worship you with a grateful spirit unafraid to look crazy unhindered with hearts that are unencumbered. Lord, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I pray as the Hope team comes down this morning to pray that if anyone in the room this morning has been looking for freedom, they've been looking for healing, for purpose, for a new beginning. They've been looking for a new perspective, a, a, a a new start. Lord, that they would run down here. We don't need to run to a 
a book in Barnes and Noble. There's nothing wrong with that, but we have your spirit this morning. We didn't come for a Christian TED talk. We came for the house to, to come and receive from the spirit of God, the transformation that you can bring, not just through information, but through your spirit. So I pray that as people come down this morning, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you bring miracles? Would you do what only you could do? Lord, we trust you. We love you. We worship you. It's in your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Would you give-